Hello, everyone. My name is Jorek. With me, Elias. Hi. And we are here to present a new language for the .NET ecosystem. The language is called VL. And also, we are presenting VVVV, which is a development environment for VL. This is kind of a premiere, since we've never presented this outside of our own little bubble. So thanks a lot to .next for giving us the chance to present here. You can think of VL as just another .NET language as C Sharp or F Sharp, only it is a visual programming language. And what we mean by that, you will see in a minute. Regarding its paradigms, it combines data flow and object-oriented programming aspects. VVVV is a live programming environment. It means that it is always running. Like when you change your program, as you modify your program, the program never stops running. Uh, and VVV uh, achieves this by using a state hot reload approach. Now, as a kind of proof of concept, we are running this whole presentation out of VVV live. So what you see here, the slides are actually a program running um, at the moment. And as I go out of full screen, you see uh, that on, uh, on this side, we have the source code of the program that is generating the slides. You see the source code, we call it patch. Uh, it consists of nodes that are connected by links that make up this running program. But before we go uh, into more detail in how the language works, uh, I want to introduce ourselves a bit more. So uh, we come to you as good cop and bad cop. I'm Jorek. I co-founded this VVV project around 18 years ago. And we're now running a little company in Germany, in Berlin, where we are six people. And I'm responsible for UX, UI. So I'm the good cop. And Elias, here is the bad cop. He will be talking to you in code. He's the one responsible for the compiler. So he will be able to answer all your technical uh, questions in detail. Uh, Elias joined us around 10 years ago. Yeah, and it was only around five years ago that we started working what we present now on this new language, VL, and the new version of VVVV that we call VVVV Gamma. Um, also, we need to tell you a bit about our background to explain why we would even go about creating our own language. Uh, why would someone do that? And then on top, you also create the development environment for it. So I want to show you a video of what people using uh, VVV are doing with it to give you an idea. And in order to show you this video, I'm asking Elias to modify the program so that we can yes, of course. play a video. Um, so I start out, I create a node here, which will in the end play the, oops, play the video file. It's just called player. Um, it has one output here, very important, which will push me the frames. Um, I need a node to draw those frames. Um, we'll connect it here. I can zoom in a little bit, sorry. And We'll now connect it to the output of the rendering. Now it's blank. Yeah, obviously I didn't kind of provide any path what to play. So let's change this. And this is the video we want to play here. And yeah, already good. And um, just need to do another one and say, whoops, sorry. Play this file, please. So, okay. Back into full screen. Yeah, so what you see here is a uh a showcase, showcase, a showreel of projects people created with VVV. So this is a classic like projection mapping on building. Uh, we see another one here. This was at the Walt Disney Music Hall in Los Angeles. So people are creating these large scale interactive projections. Interactive means that these uh, animations you see here are not necessarily videos playing but they are generated live. So that's what VVV is good for, like generating uh, graphics, interactive graphics. Here a more classic like trade showcase, also with projection mapping. Um, it's used for 
trade shows like this, brand spaces where there are a lot of screens, interactive displays, touch screens for people to interact with. It's also used a lot in, in car shows for some reason. Um, people use it for robots, controlling robots to do interactive exhibits with them. And um, this one was for Lufthansa. They built this uh, in-house service station where they show all their uh, database of all their flights. And it's used for uh, virtual reality experiences. So this one recently played in London. Uh, where six people can interact in a, in a virtual space with each other. They see each other and they experience this virtual walkthrough. So you see these applications all are very custom built. Um, as I said, these are not videos playing, but these are custom built applications. And in fact, we brought a, a schema where we show you what a typical VVV application looks like. So you get an idea of what we are building here. So a typical application has live user input. Could be from touch screens, from mobile devices, any, any, any sensor or anything. It could be a, a database providing data. Could be a web API. Data and everything comes together in VVV where the data is like transformed and prepared for the output. And the output could then be usually some large-scale projection system or could be any physical device, lasers, motors, light systems, and anything. So you see the, the, the typical, like, these applications, the nature of these applications uh, is very suitable for data flow programming because we literally have a flow of data from input to output, and, and so the, the core of many of these applications is kind of dictated by the data flow. Um, what's the, what was the next thing that we wanted to show here? Yeah. So we argued for, for data flow, and the other thing is the live aspect, that these are interactive applications that run for many hours and be interacted with uh, by, by many people. And uh, the, to design and, and create and even test such applications with live user input, that puts uh, a very special requirement on, on a development environment. And we want to show you an example for this. So you consider having an application where, you, where I would be the moderator standing in front of a wall and I have these um, labels or headlines that I want to point to and as I hit uh, the labels, uh, an image would show up. Um, now, I'm standing here and I, I say, we built this application but I cannot reach the labels, let's say. So I, I would ask Elias, can you please uh, like, tweak the program a bit so that I can better reach the labels. Obviously I can. <laughs> um, so I go in here and I, let's first bring it maybe a little more to you yeah, here. Yeah, bring it a bit uh, closer. Like closer. Closer, That's closer. That's fine, and then maybe uh, closer together all, all of right. them. Because it's a little high. Yeah. Yep. Kind of like this. I think that's fine. Okay. So you get the idea. Like uh, instead of having now to stop the program, and tweak a parameter and then start the program again and bring it into state and see, do the test again. We just tweak the parameters live. And another thing was like, uh, when I move out the hand, the slide is immediately going away. Can you build in a bit of a delay there? We can, the of course. <laughs> so we go here, we, I mean, I know what I'm doing here, but um, I do a monoflop here. It's kind of like a little node which will delay his signal and keep it on going for a little time. So let's put that maybe up to one and a half seconds. Yeah. Let's see how it reacts now. That's fine. Yeah, so you see we suddenly, even we, we inserted a few lines of code here, but we didn't have to res restart the program and then maybe make a syntax error and, and wait again for the compiler to spin up the program. Uh, so for these kind of applications, this is a very uh, important thing. Um, so that was, we have data flow, we have live programming, and the last thing is visual programming. 
So I, I'm sure you've heard of the term visual programming. Can I sh have a show of hands? Who has, who has been using uh, visual programming before? Whoa. Nobody has no, ever no, used. Three people, three people. Yeah, I, okay. Yeah. But are you familiar, have you heard of the term visual programming before? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a bit more. So uh, there are some classic and kind of famous examples, which is one of them is, is LabVIEW. Uh, by National Instruments, they built this uh, system for um, building measurement uh, systems. Then uh, Blueprint is another famous one for game uh, programming in Unreal. Um, then we have Reactor, which is a sound uh, synthesis uh, program that uses visual programming and it's famously used uh, to train kids to learn programming. This is Scratch by the MIT. Um, yeah, uh, I think um, we have explained, hopefully, why we are doing this. Uh, can you bring up the slide, uh, our slide, just to give you a, a rundown of, of our bullet points of why we think visual programming is, uh, this yeah, one. Yeah. is important. So it, it helps us, the to express the data flow paradigm. As I said, we have this idea of the data flow when we realize projects, and this paradigm is just very well expressed visually. Then we have the 2D arrangement of code. Now, some may say this helps to make even a, a, a better mess of your code because you can arrange it randomly, but really, if you do it well, the second dimension adds a lot to help you arrange the code better. Probably the number one argument for visual programming in our sense is you cannot make any syntax errors, like the case where you, are leave, like you left out the, the semicolon and find out 10 minutes later, uh, you can't do this. Um, so it saves a lot of, of prototyping time there. Um, as you saw with the player node in the very beginning, it helps us to provide often used very high level nodes as just ready building blocks it feels almost like a tool at some points where you just place these high-level nodes and they already do a lot for you. And another very important aspect in our industry is it allows even non-programmers to do simple tasks. Like in our case, we often work together with designers and then it's easy to show them, here you can tweak a color or, or a parameter yourself. You don't need to be a programmer to understand everything here. So. Um, I think we've talked enough about why we do this, and probably it's now time to make, um, basically start from scratch and show you very uh, basic examples to, to walk you through uh, how the language works, right? Yeah. Um, so I will start out, I think. So what I'm trying to do here, maybe the next 20 minutes, is kind of go a little bit deeper into the language. How does it actually work? And I will start out with a very, yeah, with the most famous example, the Hello World. So um, let me just disable the rendering here for now, because we will continue with the slides later. Um, and I just create a new document here. And, and let me stop you briefly here. So there is a tooltip uh, hanging. Yeah, that's what's, yeah, that's so um, this is our development environment. As if you started from scratch, this is what you get. And if you remember, yesterday there was a talk by Kirill who said, talked about IDE 1020, and nobody knows what IDE 30 looks like. This is our suggestion. <laughs> um, we treat the programmer more as the artist, like who starts from a blank canvas. You don't need all the buttons in your face all the time. Uh, so, Elias, please show us how we do the Hello World. Yeah, Hello World. So, I could, uh, I mean, do a Usually we just print on the console hello world, but this is what we are not used to. We are also, also we are always used to render something to an output window. So I will do it like this because that's kind of the usual style here. Um, so I will create the renderer node first. Always starts with that. Um, let's put it here maybe a little bit bigger. Scale it up, kind of. Um, let me zoom in here also. So. This is the renderer, and it has one main input, so to say, where it requires a layer, it's called. It's basically just a, a thing where it then can call back and do the drawing. And we want to display a hello world, so let's uh, use a text node, 
connected here. I will already see the text now, and there is one final input where I now have to write hello world. And so this is our hello world, so to say. Um, what I want to show you here now is um, how does this actually work? And I think you are very, yeah, you are probably very skilled C sharp programmers. So I, I think it's appropriate if I go the other way around. So I show you kind of what the system generates in pseudo code out of this little example. And then you maybe can follow along much more quickly. Um, but maybe I first should say, so this, I mean, we opened this canvas before it was this, this blank patch, I put this render on text node there, so apparently this was an entry point. So you can think of this whole canvas, kind of like your static main function, you know from a console application, but um, it's just in our case, it's not static, it's a, it's a um, kind of a, a method, an instance method, because as we see, um, when I look into the pseudo code here, I have it open here somewhere, oh no, this was not the intention that it opens like this. But, okay, so I have my, my canvas, which you can think of as a class, and each node you see here, a text node and a renderer node, it's, we can kind of see the similar in pseudocode now, that each a node of those, the renderer takes a field, basically where he stores his state, and the text node has one field where it stores its state. Then this whole canvas, this class, so to say, my entry point, um, has a constructor where he creates these two nodes. Um, if those nodes, if one of them has some resource management going on and is disposable, he will also automatically be, be disposable, so the container class. So the lifetime of those nodes is um, completely tied to the, to the auto thing. And what's happening here, because I made this connection from here to there, and so this is then happening in an, in an update loop. So for us, it makes a lot of sense that this program is always running. So it's not just as executing once and that's it and it's, it died. We always want to keep it running as explained before. So in this entry point, you have basically one update method um, where, the, where the, the values which you provide by the links, where they should go, get passed on the stack. And that we can see in pseudocode very easily so from the text node, the update is called with some parameters here, hello world, and that layer then, this local variable, then gets passed on to the renderer, and the renderer basically does an inv invalidate and refreshes this window he internally also created. Um, what else is that? So this is kind of how it generally works. It's very simple. There's, as you see, there's no interpreter going on. There's no, I don't know, lazy lazy pull behavior or reactive pushing or something. It's really very strict down to the very simple thing. Um, this has a few advantages for us because we can, for example, we see later in, in, uh, implement interfaces anywhere and just talk to any external APIs very easily. That way we don't have to think about some outer thing which always does something crazy. And, um, and maybe another Important point is also to mention that the language itself, it's a strongly typed language. So that means if I really go in here, we see that we have, oh, the tooltip is very small, Let's scale it up. Is this big enough? Maybe like this. So we see the, the, these, these nodes have different pins, and this one is, for example, uh, called position, and it's of type vector two. Next pin is uh, vector two again, and then we have some enum here, and um, then we have a string and so on, and if I, for example, the output, the layer, if I connect it, and I immediately see I can only connect it here in this example to one other pin, because this is the only one which also accept, accepts this, this type. So this is where we cannot make any syntax errors. Yeah, I mean, we can make mistakes, as I can show you here. If I, for example, force the connection to, like, the color here, I get a red link, but yeah. that will bring us to the yeah, next Yeah, that brings example. us to the next topic, like errors. Uh, since we are a live programming environment, it's like very interesting how we deal with errors. And there we distinguish, obviously, between compile time errors uh, and yes. runtime errors. Yes, so, let, uh, so errors happen all the time. So even more when you program all the time and the program is running. So let's first look at the compile time errors because they are much easier for us to deal on. Or even we say that compile time errors for us is a normal state. So for us, it's not something where we completely 
um, break off and say, no, I can't compile this, it's over because you have this one little error there. No, we say that's normal. So let me just uh, show this in a little example. So let's say I refactor this a little bit here. I'm, I'm creating a, a sub batch, I call it. I call it um, Hello World. And let's just put those nodes I placed here, um, those two guys here. Let's put them out here and move them here. So, like I made the little function now. And um, let's kind of connect it back together. Um, I want to maybe also control from outside um, the paint, like how it is drawn, what color it has. And to make it a little more interesting to see what's going on, I will add a little note here which will generate some kind of animation for the text, so the text should now, when I connect it back, um, walk around a little bit through the screen. Um, but my point is, I was talking about compile time errors. So for example, let's imagine I created this module, a week later I go in there, and it's used, I don't know, at multiple places, and for some reason, I, um, ah, sorry, before, let's connect this also here, let's draw it uh, in, in red, this note, uh, this text. So I do a fill, and there I have a color, and I just type red, for example. So I have a red text now. So back. Let's say I'm in there, and for some reason I deleted this node, uh, this pin. Um, what should happen now? Um, the thing is that the, the pin is gone, but the, as you see, the program is still keeping running. So if I go out now, if I look back at, the, at, the, at our entry point, we see the system clearly tells me now, yeah, well, the um, this node doesn't have a pin called paint, but um, still it executes the program. So that's what I mean with a compile time error. So it's, it's uh, treating it as normal. It's just basically commenting it out, but still keeps on running. Um, so the, another one would, for example, what I showed before, if I just do this, this would also be an, an error like that, that the link is, is basically going from a wrong type, which can also easily happen if you just patch something in there and then change something, and the type changes. Um, now let's go back and um, put this paint input back, so it should be red again, so it reconnected, so to say. Um, and so the other, the other errors we all know of are, are runtime errors, so how does the system deal with that? Well, there it can't deal so nicely. Um, so for example, let's say I trigger a null pointer, so I have a a very stupid node here, which is called null, which will just basically output me a null, and I connect it here to the paint, um, well, then the system will stop and it will turn this node where the arrow happened pink. It will now, if I go with the tooltip over it, I will see uh, object reference not set with some stack trace. I can go in and see, aha, uh -huh, okay, here's something null and so on. Could go further in. But as you see, the rendering stopped here. Um, so it, because it can't continue, the stack, you know, is from the exception is, is broken. All right. I think enough about errors. Enough about errors, yeah. maybe, yes. Um, um, then the next thing we wanted to show was, was it the object-oriented yes. thing? Yes. So for that, I, so because we said with data flow paradigms com combined with object orientation, so for object orientation, apparently we need something like objects. So how can we create uh, classes? How can we create methods? How can we inherit from other interfaces, can we do that all? Yes, we can, so I just want to give you a brief look how it, uh, how it looks. Um, I'm in the wrong folder here. So let's say I go here. I will also um, quit this um, example, this hello world. We don't need it anymore. And so let's just look here. I just prepared a very simple example. Let's say I want to have um, an interface here, iParticle, and I have two classes which implement this interface. And we can have a brief look how it looks. Uh, the interface is um, looking like this. So this is how an interface looks like in our language. Um, so I have a, a isHit um, method here, which takes a position for vector2 and outputs a boolean. And it also has a draw method where it takes some paint where I can kind of change the style of the rendering and it outputs this layer, which we, you've seen before, which is used by the, by the rendering um, to draw. 
And that interface now can be implemented by the particle A. Um, this is now a class. Um, as you see again, it has a, here a, the is hit test, and here it has the draw. In that case, it draws a circuit, circle and does the hit test on the circle. Further, it has an update operation, also here a method where it kind of, again, kind of makes this animation. And the same exact thing here on the particle, it's on the second uh, particle B, just the same with a rectangle. So how does this look if I um, kind of create an application out of it? So again, famous renderer, always how we start um, to see something. And um, I have a draw particles, that one I already prepared, so do not waste time here. So if I go in here, I have a draw particles node now, and it will tell me, yeah, well, I need a sequence of particles I want to draw. Um, that sequence I can, you know, I have now multiple options to, uh, sorry, a sequence is for us, it's, uh, it's just the rename of the I enumerable, so it's exactly the same thing. Um, I can now create a list, for example, and add, 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 or I, there's a convenience node for that. It's, in our case, it's called cons. Um, I take spread here. Um, which takes two types and creates a spread or a list of, of those. So I connect it here. Bam, I have a, an error because I, I'm feeding it two nulls here. Um, as you see here in the tooltip also, it shows you the, the value. Um, so clearly, first I need to give it some, something proper. So let's create those bunch of instances of those particles. Let's say particle A. I create another instance of it and uh, another instance of particle B. Um, and now I just connect them and well, mouse doesn't like me. Um, the rendering comes back. The runtime error is gone. The, the state is preserved. And now the error is back again because I added another pin here. And we'll now just finish this example. And now I have this little, little thing where I can do this hit test. And as you see, the, the three instances here I created are uh, all communicating through the iParticle interface, and it was all patched in, in this language VL. Okay, um, we saw something before the cons was transparent a bit. Ah, yeah, and yeah. So that's maybe the, the very important point um, that um, we are. So VL is uh, completely supports generics, as you have seen before when I connected the cons. In, but the nice thing is that there's a type inference always going on, so usually you don't have to annotate anything. You just connect the stuff, and the type inference figures out what's going on. It's very important for us, of course, because we want to be kind of quick, and we don't want to waste time of, on any method to put type annotations and on every variable or whatnot. So the type inference is a very, very core part of the whole thing. For that... But it also goes further, like generic support. It's, I mean, here it's clear that it's somehow there. We see that here's a spread of particle, and here's just one particle. And if I disconnect this whole stuff you've seen before, it was just a type parameter. But um, let's maybe go to another example where it goes a little deeper and where it's also it's different to a language like C Sharp. Um, because we knew from the start, for us it was important that we can um, you know, um, build um, algorithms which work on numeric uh, uh, on numeric values. Like we want to work on a vector, we want to work on a float, we want to work on a vector 3, and so on. And we all want to patch it with one code and not have multiple um, versions of it. So let's go to the last example here. It's called um, generic. So the example, what is it about? Um, you see here to the left is a circle moving around, and um, it's just moving the position. And to the, to the right, you see a rectangle changing the color. So this is reflected here. If I go in, um, th this left part of the patch here is basically um, responsible for moving that circle around. And the right part is responsible for doing this rectangle with this random color all the time. I can, we can see it clearly if I go, for example, with the tooltip over here. I see that the, the output of this, of this one a random node. I think this is uh, an important thing we should even mention extra. Yeah, like you see this, like we can inspect any value anytime. That's important. Like yeah, people yeah. ask, okay. how do you debug? That's the way we do it. We just hover the value uh, and see it. Exactly. So what I want to achieve here is uh, to want to show what, what I'm wanting to say is um, 
I want to have those, those things go um, um, very smooth. So I want to put in an animation that is, that is circled and smoothly gets animated and also the color gets animated. And for that we have a filter, it's called damper. Um, and I use this one here, the generic one. So when I now go back in here, we see clearly that this damper takes any type here. And if I now, for example, put it here to the, um, to the vector two, we'll now start doing, applying this time-based filtering mechanism. And I can use the same damper, so I can, can just, uh, whip, sorry, duplicate it, move it over here, and do it again. And here, now I have a color. I just connect the color, and it's the same thing working again. So that's very nice, and now the question is, how is this done? And for that, we came up with, an, with our own system. I mean, we started out five years ago, and, and we needed that. Um, so we wanted to be able to say plus on just, you know, on just anything, and just later on, when, the, when, the, when all the type parameters are gone on application side, when there's, everything is concrete and everything is clear, only then the system should check, hey, is there a plus available for this type you connected here? And if so, yeah, well, then you can do the whole algorithm, or a minus or a scale or whatnot. And if not, yeah, well, then tell the user, hey, well, I'm missing the following nodes. Let's say I, I miss a plus for your, for your data type. Um, I want to basically finish this to show you this a little bit. So if I go into the damper, it's rather complex immediately. Um, you see it's immediately uh, going generic. This is highlighted by those input pins that they have no filling, means they are kind of open, the type is still open. Um, I can move further in and further in, and um, a lot of things now start playing together here. Um, here have some, it sets up an oscillator function and sample state function. Um, if I go into the oscillator function, go even further in, because now in, on an oscillator level, this is getting used by many different filtering nodes. And in that case, in the damper case, it's the oscillator function damper. If I go here now, I finally see the, the real thing which is running. I, th I think I should still see the values coming in here from time to time. Here you see it's only changing the value sometimes because it's only rebuilding the function when the input, like the target position, changes. But if I go down here, this is the sample function that I see the, the time and, and whatnot. But what you can also see, and this is, a, this is a, maybe a big uh, criticism about visual programming, that this doesn't really look very neat or clean. Um, so there, it would be much nicer to, to just write the, the expression, because all this was calculated in MATLAB. And it would just be much nicer to just use the original expressions, just put them there, but still have this feature of this adaptive nodes of this, that I can just apply those expressions to any type. Um, but I hope we will come to that at some point, that we can create such a node. All right. Okay. Was that it? No, uh, the loops. Ah, yeah, sorry. Like um, one of the most important so language features. We didn't features. tell you anything about this, so... Uh, we um, should show the loops. I go back out here, and yes, we have loops. Uh, we have, you have seen it before, maybe we have these regions. These can be a lot of different things, but also loops. Let's just show one loop. It's the repeat loop. I do that by, by just, I want to, I say basically, I select what I want to loop around. So I say surround this one here with a, a repeat, let's say. Now the window will go away because I didn't put any iteration count. So the loop is not iterating at all. So the state was just killed. And so if I put it back to one, uh, the whole thing is back again. Now, if I increase it, let's say, to four, I get now four different um, windows all running, as you see, in their own kind of... So each iteration of the loop manages its own state, and um, this is kind of special. This is, like, not what you expect, maybe, but this is imp also important for us because you just want to do these things, and you don't want to, at that moment, think about what would happen. So they had some implicit behaviors built in into those regions, kind of like the state management. Okay, I think like enough of the basic so understanding this, yeah, this of was the level. Kind of just giving you a, a like a yeah overview, scratching of, the, of, the surface a little yeah. bit, to get some <clears throat> feeling how it is. Um, so I probably quit this example now yeah. here again. And also you wanted this to stuff. do the yeah maybe the last. Uh, let's go back to our slides. So I go back here, mm -hmm. and what was mine? This one. 
So to wrap it up and maybe talk a little bit how it's done. So this whole system, as I said in the beginning, it's a compiled language. It's, there's no interpreter involved. Um, so it's always generating code. Doing that, so we use uh, Rosling for the for the code generation. Um, it's doing that in an incremental fashion, obviously, because it can't just redo everything all the time. It, it basically, based on the user changes, it needs to figure out, okay, what is affected by those user changes, and that just, then just recompile this little part and um, do that in mem memory also, and then basically emit the new assembly, which reuses nearly everything from before, like from the baseline, and then you get such a little, basically a little tree of little assemblies which kind of reuse the code from before. Um, and also, once you have done that, you also need to, to ensure that the state you have, that you swap it out. So you have, Because you still have the running program, program, which is running maybe, let's say, on these assemblies here, and now you created this new one, so now you need to traverse into the runtime graph and kind of set the pointers um, so that the actual new assembly kind of gets in and the new code gets basically called. And yeah, the nice thing that we use Roslin is that we can also generate a complete uh, C sharp solution file with all the projects. So we can write it all out into, into the folder. And then you have just the standard solution. You can just open Visual Studio if you want. You can debug everything and you can just create anything with that. All right. Okay. So I think then the last demo will be. Like we've seen uh, the basics now, and I want to do a, a little more high-level example. Uh, you all know, for, as de uh, .NET developers, you know NuGet, the package managing system. And I want to show you how we can just, still while the program is running, download a nugget uh, and use it. I want to use the Microsoft uh, Cognitive Services speech uh, nugget to create a little text-to-speech um, application um, <clears throat> and I will just uh, do it here so we don't have a proper package manager yet so we have to do this from the command line and I would just do nuget install Microsoft cognitive services speech um, this will install the nugget and actually tells me I have already installed this before, in this case. Um, now, I will first create the definition of our speech recognizer node. So I will um, create a process uh, definition, as we call it, and that will be our speech recognizer. I go in there, and all I have to do to uh, kind of activate uh, the nugget is to set a dependency to it. So here it's now listing all the nuggets I have installed. I can choose this one that I was interested in. Now it's mostly about the API of that speech recognizer. So as, as I set the reference, what happened is now uh, all the, the, the full API of the speech recognizer is showing up as nodes in the node browser. Um, now I just need to know, obviously, what I'm looking for because it's quite a, a huge uh, API. I'm looking for the speech recognizer, and I want to create it. <coughs> um, well, let me get this a bit smaller. Uh, so the constructor takes a speech config, and I happen to know that I can create such a config from subscription. And this one takes a region string and it takes the subscription key, the API key. You should zoom a little in there. Yeah, correct. So the region is uh, North Europe. And the subscription key I will just copy from my Azure portal here. Um, and then as I construct an instance of this, I want to store it in a field. This field I will call a recognizer. And the important thing is this is what I only want to do once, right? It's the constructor of the thing. I want to store it in the field once. So what I'm doing is I assign these two nodes to the create uh, operation. You see they turned white because white for us means uh, constructor. 
So now the recognizer will be here, and the recognizer has one event that's called recognizing. Uh, events in VL are being translated by the system to observables. So here I can nicely now deal with the observable of event pattern of speech recognition event arcs. And I can use a for each uh, reactive region here to now react on every call of the event. First, I need to unpack the event pattern arguments. This gives me the speech recognition event arcs. So, recognition event arcs should be here. I take the result of those. Then I happen to know that the speech recognition result is also a recognition result. Uh, but this already gives me the text that it detected as a string. I can pipe out the string here of the for each, and then I have an observable of string. Now I'm always just interested in the last uh, thing, so I'm calling hold latest here on that. And this will return me the last uh, detected text. This is basically it, but now I need uh, to add functionality so I can start and stop the recognizer. For this, I'm using start continuous recognition um, and stop continuous recognition. Was it the right? Yeah. Um, they both connect to the recognizer, and in order for them not to be executed all the time, I will also put them in, uh, surround them with an if region, both of them, so I can only call them as I need it. Then I'm using a fancy node called togedge, which allows me to send a bang to either this if region, if region or the other if region as I enable or disable uh, this node. So this should already be it. Um, I'm now going back to the main application where you see this is where we created the definition initially, but now I will create an actual application of the node. And this one should be here. So now an actual instance got created the constructor was called once, and if I enable this, and if everything works, then this should now already detect what I say. So let me finally also use this string. Actually, let's make some space here. I'm using the text node again to draw the string and I need to give it a color so that it's not white. Okay, yeah. So I'm glad this all worked uh, wow. in a live demo. Um, things can go wrong. Um, and I think we're here to wrap it up. Yes. Um, with the summary. I wanted to talk uh, briefly about our next steps, what we have planned. At the moment, we are still a .NET framework, but obviously uh, for uh, being able to deploy to other uh, systems, we want to switch to .NET Core 3 soon. Then we are currently working on integrating the Senko 3D engine. If you anyhow somehow interested in 3D rendering, the Senko engine is a free MIT licensed, completely written in C sharp, extremely professional uh, uh, render engine, and we are we will be using it in VVV for all the drawing. Um, at some point, we want to make the editor cross platform. Um, one of the most difficult things, I guess, will be in the future to have support for Visual Diff because. As you know, like diffing uh, source code is very important for versioning it. And in a visual programming language, this is really a challenge. We have no idea yet, but this will be an interesting quest uh, 
to embark on. And uh, also we want to offer VL as you saw here as a visual scripting integration for other tools. So we're hoping that in the future other tools who would uh, need any like visual like uh, scripting engine uh, instead of using any other like textual language, they could be interested in using VL and embed that into their system. And finally, um, to summarize what you saw, VVV is a development environment for the visual.net language VL. We haven't talked about at all like how we finance this. Uh, it's completely free without any restrictions to try for you. Um, only commercial use requires a developer license per seat. But uh, really, uh, we are most interested in that you go to this website and download and try it. There is, you don't even have to send us your email or anything. We just want to hear from you uh, when you like it. Or if you don't like it, also tell us, of course, why you don't like it. Or, or that you even have a use case for that, maybe, because yeah. we are coming from a completely different niche. Yeah. And so it would be interesting if there's, I don't know, anything like that, where you ever wanted something like this. That's the reason and we are here is yeah. to hear from you where or how this could be interesting outside of our bubble that we showed. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. So we have time for questions. Uh, thank you. What type of software do you expect to be developed with your tool? So who is the user of your software? Because it seems that uh, it's still uh, too, too hard to understand for some non-developer user how to do, for instance, this uh, example with uh, speech recognition. But uh, also, it's hard for, uh, as I think, for a developer, because uh, for me, it's harder to use some blocks uh, instead of uh, writing code. Uh, were you here at the beginning of the talk when we showed what people are doing? Maybe two minutes late. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah. but you saw? Did did you see the the video that we showed of like of the projects that people realized with it? No. So, you will okay. see it on the website. Okay. Uh, on the website, we have the same video, and it explains what people are doing right now with it. And the question is exactly as I said: we come here to show this to you to get ideas of what other people would do with it. That's exactly the question. Because we think it's, it's more than what we do so far with it. That's our hope. OK, one more question. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I want to ask if it's possible to create your own like uh, C-sharp library, and not to download or to upload it to Nujet, but to use it like, you know, like a library in my own project. Of course, yeah. of course. So like, it's possible to yeah, import yeah. it. Yeah. Like you, you write three lines of code and you have a node for that, basically. And how will it uh, take like pins, you know, for input and output? Should I use some kind of uh, SDK or something no, like that's that? No, that's not. That's the point. It's really just calling. When you create a class in C Sharp, for example, you can simply just use it. Okay, thank you. Uh, it, it is shown by, as we just download a nugget they don't use an SDK, right? So that explains that you can use any .NET library that you write and you just drag it in and, and work with it as if it was code. And one more. Keep it coming. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, I know that there is a very huge problem to swap uh, code online, especially on C Sharp and not that .NET. And I would like to know uh, how did you achieve that? Uh, there are two ways you can use framework dependent uh, procedures or maybe structure dependent procedures. How did you achieve the hot swap? which works so smooth and excellent and very beautiful. Thank you. Uh, well, um, it's, um, 
the, the hot swap is first I have to say it's not perfect. So there are cases where it fails. Okay, just to get that out of the thing. So it, because it has to apply some kind of heuristic. Um, because if it uh, traverses too deep, I go anywhere. And if I have, I don't know, 100, uh, let's say 500 megabytes of memory, it can't traverse there, right? But usually, since um, you don't kind of um, build the library down there, you, usually you're at the higher level. So when you build applications like those, you've seen in the beginning, you are kind of combining blocks to each other. So you, in the end, you, you end up very high in, when you think of the, of, the, of the runtime graph, of the object hierarchy internally, right? You are basically often very high up there. So you just change stuff here. So the, the whole um, traversal doesn't have to go so far. Okay, it usually just needs to go there and then it's usually done. So this is basically a heuristic, like I said, it's based on the compiler information where it said, hey, well, I had to, because the user changed something down here, I had to, all the dependencies I had to create a new, then it's also clear, okay, I have to traverse probably a lot. But if, it, if the changes are really like on the top of the pyramid, then also the traversal doesn't have to go so deep. But like I said, it's a heuristic, so there can be, when there are a lot of indirections, it can be that it fails. In that case, but that usually only happens when you're really working on a, on a really deep level. And in that case, it's usually fine that you just, you know, press F8 to stop it and F5 when it comes up fresh and clean, which also goes very fast. But yeah, it's kind of like 1% of the cases in, in our experience. <laughs> The next question, uh, I, th I thought that you generate an assembly every time uh, we change the code. How do you manage the memory? Uh, doesn't it, it leak? It, uh, right now it leaks, so these little assemblies get uh, stay in memory, but I have high hopes for the assembly load context introduced in that core. Uh, I think that's possible now to, to um, unload assemblies because it was possible in, in, in the .NET framework, but only you had to use this reflection API called dynamic assemblies. So you could only go through that API. So you had to use reflection emit. You had to go that path. And there you could do that. You could create dynamic assemblies, which when you basically removed all the dependencies on it, it got unloaded by the garbage collector. But in that core, I think they have a new API and even cleaner, and it should work with this approach. Um, I mean, I didn't try it yet, I just read about it over the last half year, and I was I'm basically waiting to change everything to net core and then try it out. But um, these, these leaks are really not, uh, usually not the issue. Are, these assemblies are usually very small. I don't know, after five hours of working, it's, I don't know, if it's a few megabytes, it's really, it's not, usually not the, the problem at all. Hi, thank you for the session. And uh, let's imagine that I uh, develop some maybe video editor. What is the deployment scenario for my customers, my uh, clients, uh, if I uh, develop it using visual language programming? Um, like so far in the examples we showed, the deployment was always very custom, um, if that's the question. Like, yeah. The, um, because there is another thing we, we haven't mentioned. All the projects we showed were realized with our old version. With It's called VVV Beta. And this one, what we demonstrated is VVV Gamma. Only with this version you are able, only this is a compiled version where you can create executables. The previous one was an interpreted version and you would always just deploy the whole thing there. It was very custom and it, it was never used for like a, a product. And this we hope will change now. Like it's a whole set of new use cases that we introduce by being able to deploy actual executables that you can share. Yeah. yeah. And we have time for one last question. Hi, uh, thank you for this great talk. Uh, for sure, I want to try it. But uh, if I only imagine how a lot of all these lines I have to dry 
draw, draw, draw to just get something very simple makes me really scary. Mm -hmm. uh, question is, uh, if I download your, uh, your demo version from the site, is there any uh, sample source codes yes. of many, may, maybe repositories available for us? Yes, uh, if you just, if you would download it and I've just press F1 here, okay, help. Uh, but I think it's also on the website explained. Yeah. Um, but then a, a help browser like this will open up and there are, these are all examples here. Um, I mean, they are now more on computer vision and stuff, but these are all like little patched examples which have all a little topic where you can somehow, ah, okay, that's how they do that, and ah, okay, okay. So you get some more, you know, general idea how it works, maybe. And also on the website, you have a link to YouTube with our, like, video tutorials about it. 